Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Wolfieland. When I'm not carrying a blonde up the Empire State Building and giving up halfway because it's way too many flights of stairs, I'm here at the Wolfieland reviewing movies. In this video, I'll be reviewing what is not only one of my favorite movies, but what is also easily one of the greatest and most influential films of all time. King Kong, directed by Marion C. Cooper and Ernest B. Schutzek, and released in 1933. Look at Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. A timeless tale of Beauty and the Beast, but this Beauty and the Beast story happens to also have dinosaurs, a giant ape, and Fay Ray in her prime. Whatever happened to Fay Ray? That delicate, satin-draped frame. Oh yeah, she died like 20 years ago. Never mind. I wish you wouldn't keep hopping on that. It's very mean of you. Yes, King Kong stands as tall today as an icon of cinema as he did when he first caught the public's imagination during the Great Depression. The image of Kong climbing the Empire State Building is burned into our collective consciousness. The titular Great Ape Kong is far from cinema's first giant movie monster, but I think it's safe to say Kong was the first giant monster to become a star, which is quite remarkable considering the monsters that were stars at the time were played by actors. While Kong was in reality an 18-inch puppet brought to life a frame at a time by the hand of unsung animators. King Kong the film was also the first of its type that came about at the perfect time. King Kong is purely escapist fantasy filmmaking that brought depression era audiences to another world unlike any they had ever seen before, distracting them from their everyday despairs for the price of an admission ticket. Why the whole world will pay to see this? But where did the modern myth that is King Kong even come from? Well, not from Skull Island, but like in the movie itself, bringing the eighth wonder to audiences was a collaborative effort. Let's start with the film's two directors, Marion C. Cooper and Ernest B. Schutzek, who drew from their real life for the movie. Cooper and Schutzek were both veteran World War I pilots and larger-than-life men of adventure, globetrotters who became creative partners, starting out with the documentary Grass, about a nomadic tribe's difficult journey, followed by another documentary, Chang about a farmer's survival in the jungles of Thailand. Cooper and Schutzek were men without fear. When they wanted to get a picture of a charging tiger, they climbed up a tree with a camera and told it to look pretty. If he wants a picture of a lion, he just goes up to him and tells him to look pleasant. While shooting a picture in Africa, Cooper encountered a family of baboons, which gave him some inspiration. Cooper was always fascinated by primates ever since he was a boy and decided that his next film should revolve around an ape, but not an ordinary gorilla. Cooper's ape would be a titan, and Cooper also wanted the ape to go down in a blaze of glory fighting planes atop a skyscraper. The question was, and how to pull that off in the early 1930s when sound was just starting to take off. Around this time, Cooper was also enamored by accounts of a then-mysterious giant lizard dubbed the Komodo Dragon, and Cooper originally planned for his yet unnamed giant terror gorilla film to just have a normal-sized ape fight a Komodo Dragon for real against a tiny jungle backdrop that would just make them seem huge. Thankfully, that didn't fucking happen. This is where the great Willis O'Brien comes into play, who, along with the equally talented sculptor Marcel Delgado, brought some of cinema's greatest monsters to life through the process of stop-motion animation. Willis O'Brien was a pioneer of the stop-motion medium, taking photographs of a subject, puppets usually, that are gradually moved frame by frame to give the subject the illusion of movement when played in sequence. Stop-motion animation is in the same ballpark as 2D or 3D computer animation. Stop-motion just involves animating 3D subjects in the real world by hand, not with pen and paper, not on a computer. Willis O'Brien's early stop-motion work frequently involved bringing prehistoric creatures back to life, with O'Brien's most famous pre-King Kong work being The Lost World in 1925, based on the Arthur Conan Doyle novel of the same name, seemingly bringing humans into contact with dinosaurs on film. The animation of The Lost World looks a bit crude by today's standards, but what makes these dinosaurs convincing as film characters comes down to the thought and personality Willis O'Brien injected into the movements of his puppets. They weren't just mindless toy monsters, they felt like real animals with feelings. It also helped that Marcel Delgado sculpted such detailed creatures for O'Brien to animate. Their models were metal armatures designed by O'Brien, surrounded by rubber or cloth muscles and a sculpted latex skin created by Delgado. 
They can even make their tiny creatures simulate breathing by inflating balloons inside their models between shots. But when you're ahead of the curve, doing things that nobody's ever thought of before, you tend to not be very well appreciated in your time. Lost World was a respectable hit, but there still wasn't much of a market for this type of movie yet. There wasn't much demand for stop-motion effects at the time either, but eventually in 1931, Willis O'Brien began developing another epic involving prehistoric creatures called Creation for RKO. Very similar to Lost World in concept. Creation didn't have a very exciting story, though. It seemed more like a stop-motion experiment, taking the methods that O'Brien pioneered on Lost World and pushing them forward to create more lifelike dinosaurs without having a better story to go along with them. It's the now classic effects coming before the story thing. Literally, since the only things ever shot for Creation were test shots for the stop-motion effects, Marion C. Cooper recommended that RKO shut down the expensive production of Creation. Willis O'Brien became aware of Cooper's desire to make a film involving a giant ape, then known as the Beast. It was beauty killed the Beast. So O'Brien sought to convince Cooper to let O'Brien stay employed at RKO and bring Cooper's Beast to life through stop-motion animation. Unbeknownst to Willis O'Brien, though, when Marion C. Cooper shut down production on creation, Cooper always intended to hire O'Brien to handle effects on the Beast. Cooper may have been unimpressed with Creation's story, but he was very impressed with Creation's stop-motion animation, and put Willis O'Brien in charge of the Beast's effects, but you wouldn't know it with O'Brien's vague credit as chief technician on the film. <laughs> Speaking of the story, Marion C. Cooper only had a vague idea of what the beast would be about, but eventually he settled on titling it King Kong. Kong was derived from the Congo, with a K instead of a C because Cooper loved the letter K, hopefully not times three. And the king came from a need for the movie to be two words instead of one, so audiences wouldn't think Cooper made another documentary like Grass or Chang. Overall, Cooper wanted the title to be the name of the film's star, like with Dracula. He wanted to create a star out of this movie, essentially. Heavens, what a mob! Well, you would come, and these tickets cost me 20 bucks. Cooper fleshed the story of King Kong out with British writer Edgar Wallace, but Wallace died in early 1932 before a final draft could be delivered. Wallace's script involved a circus showman who finds the eighth wonder of the world on a hidden island with dinosaurs and brings Kong back to New York where the ape climbs the Empire State Building, but the ape is killed when lightning strikes it. Another draft was written by James Creelman, but it was considered too slow-paced for the action film Cooper wanted to make, so Cooper hired Ruth Rose to handle rewrites. Rose was the wife of Ernest B. Schutzek, Kong's co-director, and Rose often accompanied her husband on expeditions. So with the writing of Kong's script, Ruth Rose not only made the film more fast-paced, but also injected it with her real-life experiences going on adventures with her husband Schutzek and Marion C. Cooper, giving it the spirit of a Schutzek Cooper adventure documentary. I'm going ashore with you, aren't I? You bet. I don't think she ought to go till we find out what's going on. With a script finalized for RKO, King Kong was shot using the same sets and even some of the same actors as another jungle-themed Shudzak film, The Most Dangerous Game. And when King Kong finally saw release, it was a massive hit despite releasing during the lowest point of the Great Depression, making $5 million on a budget just under 700 grand. Even though people were broke, they still flocked to the cinema to catch a glimpse at Skull Island, just to take their minds off of how broke they were. Soup tonight, coffee and sinkers in the morning. Enough background, though. What is it about King Kong that makes it such an iconic film? In other words, what makes Kong the king? I'll explain why I think that is in my review of King Kong. But first, I have a message for my sponsor. Me! Pledge to my Patreon today to support the channel, help it continue to grow, and you'll also get access to weekly movie nights every Sunday and archive commentaries if you miss the movie nights live. Just five bucks a month to get a movie night every week. Here's the movie I'll be streaming next Sunday. Pledge to Patreon.com slash Dr. Wolfula if you're interested and I thank you in advance. Say, is this the moving picture ship? After a totally real expository Arabian proverb, the movie's story concerns the making of a film within the film, a nature documentary by famed filmmaker Carl Denham, who's charted a voyage aboard a ship called the Venture to regions unknown for a mysterious new film. Still, you always bring back a picture. And everybody says there's only one Carl Denham. Mm. Taking Denham on the journey is the Venture's captain, Anglehorn, and the ship's first mate, Jack Driscoll. Oh, why didn't you say so? Come on aboard! 
The production of Denim's new film has hit a snag, though. He doesn't have a leading lady for the movie. Gasp! Oh, no! The public, bless him, must have a pretty face to look at. Everybody likes romance. Denim also doesn't have a cast in general for his film, which is supposed to be a nature documentary anyway, but all you really need to put asses in the seats is one hot blonde and a tall, dark leading man. And this movie has the tallest and darkest of all leading men. Unless you count Bradley Cooper. That guy's a dreamboat. Er, anyway, Denim is trying to find a broad for his picture last minute, but the gals you'd find on the streets of Depression-era Manhattan late at night aren't the kinds of faces you'd put on a movie poster. They're the kinds of faces you'd put on a wanted poster! <laughs> I gotta remember that one. <laughs> Denim happens upon a young lady committing the crime of apple touching. Ha <laughs> ha! I catch you, you stealer! But Denim comes in clutch. Here's a buck. A book. Scram. One dollar in 1933 was worth twenty-four dollars in today's money. So anywho, Carl abducts the lass, and after treating Ann Darrow here to a full spread at IHOP, Carl proposes that Ann leave her promising life of homelessness behind and come along with Denim as the star of his next picture. It's the thrill of a lifetime and a long sea voyage that starts at six o'clock tomorrow morning. And, you know, seeing as how Anne is homeless with nothing better to do than freeze to death or sell her body in the streets of New York, of course Anne takes Carl up on his offer. What do I have to do? Little trivia, Fay Ray is most famous for her role in Kong, so she's popularly thought of as a blonde. But in reality, she was a brunette. Fay Ray decided to wear a blonde wig so she'd be more of a contrast to her leading men. So, yeah, the carpets don't match the drapes. I wish you wouldn't keep hopping on that. It's very mean of you. The first half of the original King Kong can be a bit rough once they're on the ship and off to wherever it is they're going to. It's a slow burn of exposition about Carl Denham's island and a sort of weird romance between Anne and the first mate Jack Driscoll, played by Bruce Cabot. Well, we're off! We're off! Jack is kind of a dick. I guess you don't think much of women on ships, do you? No, they're a nuisance. Instantly dismissive of Anne, even when she's being so nice to him and just wants everybody on the ship to like her. Women, women just can't help being a bother. Made that way, I guess. And Jack only starts to profess his feelings for Anne when Anne begins to withdraw interest in him. Say, I guess I love you. I guess it is a pretty good strategy, actually. You make a woman feel like total shit, and then she'll figure she's lucky to be with you. Ah, oh, I gotta write this down. Why, Jack, you hate women. Yeah, I know. But you aren't women. Admittedly, the 1930s idea of a sweet romance isn't quite as sweet when viewed through a modern lens. I didn't apologize very good for hitting you just now. That was a pretty tough rap on the chin. Uh-huh. But something worth noting is that King Kong, minus the giant monkey, is kind of autobiographical. Like I said before, the final drafts were written by Ruth Rose, the wife of the film's co-director, Ernest B. Shudsack. The couple really met and fell in love with each other on a freighter headed to an island where Shudsack was shooting a movie. In this case, one of the Galapagos Islands. Shudsack and Rose stayed married until Rose's death, and Shudsack died a year after her. A marriage of more than 50 years that brought King Kong to the world. So, yeah, there were very strong parallels between what happened in real life and what happens in this movie. And it's clear that Ruth Rose was drawing upon her real life experience being courted by her husband, who was probably rough around the edges like Jack Driscoll, but stuck beside her until the end. And yeah, the main trio of human characters in King Kong are all directly based upon three of the creative forces behind the film. Jack is Ernest B. Shudsack, Anne is Ruth Rose, and Carl Denham is obviously Marion C. Cooper. Self-inserts, you could say, but some spooky trivia is that Robert Armstrong, the actor who played Carl Denham, died less than a day before Marion C. Cooper did. His character's basis. Their deaths were 16 hours apart. It's like they were one and the same. I'm on the level. No funny business. The opening of the original King Kong takes its time, but it's not just so we get to know the characters before they're off on their adventure. Like Charlie, the potato-peeling cook of the adventure, who adds some, uh, much-needed diversity to the crew. Someday me go back China, never see no more potato. <laughs> The buildup of the film is also so the movie can hype up the adventure's mystery destination southwest of Sumatra. 
When do we find out where we're going? Pretty soon now. Skull Island, a legendary place few have journeyed to and lived to tell the tale of, that contains behind an ancient wall Kong, a mythical beast no white man has ever seen before. Yeah, there's something on that island that no white man has ever seen. Everybody else in the world has seen it, though, so now it's Whitey's turn to take a gander. Did you ever hear of Kong? Why, yes. The Skull Island hype is also for the benefit of the audience, especially the film's original 1933 audience, building anticipation to sights they've never seen before, hooking the audience in for the long run when the venture finally reaches its destination. Huh, the mountain doesn't look that much like a skull. It looks more like an oven mitt. I guess oven mitt island doesn't sound as scary, though. This is the impressive thing about Skull Island in 1933. It's not a real island. It's a completely fictional and fantastical location realized through a mixture of rear projection and film exposure techniques to place or composite the live action actors and sets against the larger than life backdrops of Skull Island, which was in reality just matte paintings or miniatures. I believe the only location shooting done for Skull Island was the establishing shot of the venture crew arriving at the beach. Everything else had to be shot on a backlot or a soundstage with much of the environments created in post-production. In essence, King Kong is the great granddaddy of the modern blockbuster, pioneering the use of what would eventually lead to the chroma key green slash blue screen methods used prevalently in big budget movies today to add almost everything an audience will see later. But all of the effects in King Kong had to be created by hand, no computers to lighten the load. To help sell the illusion of Skull Island being a real dense jungle and not a flat backdrop, a foreground layer of glass with foliage painted on top of it would be placed between the camera and the miniature environments to help add a sense of depth and detail to the compositions. The effect gives the jungle of Skull Island an ethereal quality influenced by the artwork of Gustave Doré. Holy mackerel, what a show! The natives of Skull Island were supposedly descended from a higher civilization, the only remnant of their ancestors being the island's distinctive massive wall. Yeah, but what's on the other side of that wall? That's what I want to know. The natives only occupy a small peninsula. The rest of the island is behind the wall, along with the god they fear and worship, Kong. <laughs> whom they intend to offer the sacrifice of a young girl. They handle a strange group of people trespassing on their land pretty well. They don't try to start a fight, but they are preoccupied with taking Anne off of Jackson Denham's hands. Malamafakano! He's offering to trade six of his women for Anne. So, you know, the Skull Islanders do engage in some human trafficking, but who doesn't? I'm gonna take her back to the ship. Later that night, the Skull Islanders kidnap Anne, and their ritual goes on unabated. Torches going through the village. Looks like the night before election. Oh, come on. Even movies from back in the 30s are getting political. Look, sir, me find on fix. Crazy black man been here. The Venture crew realize Anne has been captured, but it's too late. Those crazy black men have already offered Anne to their god Kong, the king of Skull Island. And the Venture crew, led by Denim and Jack, aim to rescue Anne before harm falls upon her. Or worse, before King Kong can give Anne his ding-dong. Look at the size of that thing! He must be as big as a house! King Kong the film was a step forward from Willis O'Brien's previous work as a stop-motion animator. Skull Island inherited the land lost to time inhabited by dinosaurs that was in the lost world in the cancelled creation, but with more experience, time, and budget behind it, the dinosaurs of Kong were animated far more smoothly and realistically. There was more thought put into their movement and behavior. King Kong was also much more action-oriented compared to Lost World, which felt more like a nature mockumentary in comparison, while Marion C. Cooper placed more emphasis on King Kong having a forward momentum, pushing Willis O'Brien to make the dinosaurs far more fierce, with even long-documented herbivores turned into man-eating hunters. <laughs> It makes Skull Island out to be the most treacherous place on Earth. The Dinosaurs of Kong were the most sophisticated depiction to date, but the real edge of the movie is its star, of course, Kong himself. <laughs> animating dinosaurs is one thing, animating an ape-like creature, something far more expressive and human in nature, is another thing. Willis O'Brien, 18 years prior, had toyed with animating an ape creature in a short film titled The Dinosaur and the Missing Link, but that was far more crude in nature, and it was a fully animated short. Kong and the other creatures of Skull Island had to convincingly interact with real actors, and Kong himself has a very special relationship with Fay Ray. 
This was accomplished in a variety of ways. One way to blend the human actors with the creatures involved rear projection. You project a reel of animation on a translucent screen and the actors are able to time their performances with the animation. Of course, sometimes the characters, like Anne, would just be another puppet held by Kong, but O'Brien would find clever ways to seamlessly include the real actors in a stop-motion shot any opportunity he could, projecting live-action images of the actors in the stop-motion shots a frame at a time. The other way Kong interacts with the real actors is the most obvious. They built a large-scale hand for grabbing Fei Rei, along with a large-scale head. Sometimes it can look silly, especially the head, because the scale Kong's fingers and face don't move much, but when the large-scale hand holding Anne is blended through rear projection with the small-scale animated puppet in front, the combined effect is fantastic. The level of detail put into every shot of Skull Island is astounding, and hey, with the big Kong head, you can have close-ups of real guys getting eaten, too. What makes King Kong such an icon isn't just the effects involved in bringing him to life. That's technology. What makes Kong so beloved is that he's more than just a puppet or a monster. Kong is an actual character, and making him a character involved a human touch, both literally and figuratively. Willis O'Brien put a bit of himself into the animated performance of King Kong. Getting into the mind of this giant creature that was in reality a tiny figure moved a frame at a time. There's a sensitivity to the portrayal of Kong as more than just a brute, down to subtle details like Kong picking a tiny flower to give to Anne. Kong might be violent and vengeful, but he has a heart. He loves Anne, even if she doesn't quite feel the same way, which leads to Kong's downfall. There's a sense of relatable, tragic humanity to Kong that makes him sympathetic despite being a powerful beast. <laughs> There was a dispute between Marion C. Cooper and Willis O'Brien over Kong's design. Initially, Kong was intended to be a weird human-ape hybrid, but eventually Cooper decided to make Kong more of an ape. While O'Brien pushed for Kong to have more human-like features, eventually a middle ground was reached in the final film, with Kong's face looking distinctly ape-like, but through Marcel Delgado's sculpting, Kong's face is allowed a wide range of human-like expression that makes Kong lovable despite his ferocious nature. There was actually a pair of different Kong puppets for the sake of accomplishing multiple shots in the film simultaneously. One of them had a thinner face, the other had a squatter face. It could take a month and a half to complete one minute of stop-motion animation, so being able to animate multiple Kongs would have been a godsend. Willis O'Brien was also once a professional boxer before becoming an animator and drew upon his experiences as a fighter for King Kong's spectacular battles with the dinosaurs on Skull Island, most memorably with Kong wrestling the T-Rex. It's such a lavishly choreographed fight sequence, especially for its time. It isn't just Kong punching, the T-Rex biting, they're grappling with each other, destroying the scenery. <laughs> There's a brutality in the fight you could only really do with puppets at the time. You'd almost never see this level of violence carried out between human stunt performers in a film back then. It's a desperate battle for survival that ends with Kong snapping the Rex's jaw apart. Savage as fuck! But ultimately, Kong is a monkey, and monkeys are curious, so Willis O'Brien had Kong playfully fidget with the dino's loose jaw. It's a strangely charming, cute moment after a display of savage superiority. King Kong came out at the perfect time. A year after its release, the Hayes Code was introduced, meaning that films had to be submitted for censorship before they could be approved for release. But that also meant that re-releases of King Kong over the years had to cut out some scenes of Kong's destruction, or this scene where Kong very tastefully rips off an unconscious Fei Rei's clothes and pokes at her, smelling his fingers. They should call him Kinky Kong. What made this censorship so catastrophic was that films generally weren't preserved at all. If something was cut out of a film, it was often just destroyed, so the deleted footage of Kong was thought to be lost for years until a print that included all of the lost footage was discovered in 1969, and King Kong was restored to its originally released state. One scene deleted from the film before its release has long eluded film historians, though. A scripted spider pit scene. It involved a cut sequence of a Styracosaur chasing the Venture Crewman onto a log that Kong drops into a ravine, the latter of which is seen in the film. 
Followed by another completely deleted scene involving survivors of the log's fall being eaten by horrifying monsters inside the pit. There's a lot of evidence supporting this sequence's existence within the film itself. The crew members are chased by something unseen onto the log that they're reacting to while Kong shakes the log. They have to have some reason not to run off onto the other side of the log. <laughs> Later, an iguana-like monster emerges from the pit trying to attack Jack, the only survivor of the log attack. Years after the film's release, photographs were leaked showing off the deleted spider pit sequence, the stills of which included the very reptile that tried to attack Jack after climbing out of the pit. There are varying reasons for why the spider pit sequence was cut. Supposedly, RKO believed it to be too gruesome and frightening for the time, but Marion C. Cooper himself claimed to have cut it because it slowed the movie down dealing with the fates of background characters. The spider pit sequence remains lost, but thankfully, while shooting his King Kong remake, Peter Jackson and his Weta Workshop made a recreation of what the sequence might have looked like using authentic methods. It's not the real thing, but it looks cool and like it could have believably been made in the 30s. It's great to just have an idea of what this lost sequence might have been like. <laughs> There have been claims in recent years, though, that King Kong's spider pit sequence never got past the scripting stage, and was never even photographed for the film due to it being crossed out on the shooting schedule, and that the photos leaked of the scene were merely of test shots, rendering the spider pit sequence non-existent. But there's more evidence that the spider pit sequence existed than there is evidence that it didn't exist at all. And since the film of the sequence was supposedly destroyed anyway, it wouldn't exist anymore today to have its existence disproven. But if it still did exist, then you wouldn't be able to disprove its existence. I don't know what I'm fucking talking about. I believe in the spider pit scene though, because it sounded really fucking cool. I want to believe that really fucking cool things can exist. <laughs> Visually, Kong is an innovative and influential film, but it can't be understated how much of a leap forward the film's soundscape is. The first talkie was released only six years prior to Kong. Synchronized soundtracks were still very new to films, and audio libraries didn't exist at the time. Kong also depicted a world that didn't exist, and the creatures that populated it couldn't quite sound like creatures that already existed. Sound engineer Murray Spivak had to record, mix, and warp all the sounds of the film himself, which is standard practice today, but there was very little precedent for this at the time. Spivak had to figure all this out himself through experimentation in 1930s technology. What does Kong sound like? He can't just sound like a gorilla. Maybe his roar sounds like a mix of a lion and a tiger reversed. Yeah, that sounds good. The movie's score, composed by Max Steiner, was also the first of its kind for a talkie film. Extensive themes to help tell the story of the movie create an atmosphere for Skull Island. The various characters and places of the film have their own operatic leitmotifs to give each scene its own unique sense of feeling. <laughs> Kong's movement is often accompanied by a powerful droning score, while Anne Darrow's themes are often more lilting and romantic. Steiner's score was innovative, but in some places his scoring has been seen as overbearing, using the score in places of sound effects in some areas. The most obvious being the music accompanying each step taken by Skull Island's chief. This is referred to today as Mickey Mousing because it's something you generally only hear at cartoons because in live action movies it's kinda cheesy, but it works in King Kong because it is a cheesy movie. It's not trying to capture reality. The whimsical score heightens the film's fantasy. King Kong is a filmic fairy tale. <laughs> Ultimately, Jack Driscoll manages to, against all odds, rescue Anne, the love of his life he's known for a few days, and it only cost the lives of two dozen men he's known for years. Hoes before bros! I'm alright. And speaking of the human cost in saving Anne, Kong manages to storm Skull Island's gates and goes totally sick house of the Skull Islanders' asses. <laughs> The one thing this civilization has spent eons preventing, and it happens a day after some white guys show up on their island. Fortunately, Carl Denham manages to knock Kong out with a gas bomb, and upon looking at the unconscious beast, Denham decides the best venue to display Kong is Broadway! 
He's gonna make Kong do putting on the Ritz. What's Dunham got anyway? Well, it better be good after all this bally. How did the venture bring Kong back to New York? Ah, don't worry about it. This eighth wonder of the world Broadway show aspect of the plot is a leftover from when the film was supposed to be about a circus act showcasing Kong. It's not much of a show, though. Just looking at a crucified giant ape. What kind of show you got for us, Mr. Burns? Well, the ape's going to stand around for three hours or so. Sensational! But at least Kong's chains are made out of unbreakable chrome steel. Don't be alarmed, ladies and gentlemen. Those chains are made of chrome steel. There's no way he could possibly escape. Okay, they probably should have specified no flash photography. So Kong is let loose in a different kind of jungle, the concrete jungle. Rampaging through the streets of Manhattan, killing everybody in sight until Kong finds Anne. But even then, Kong still makes sure to go out of his way, killing some more random people. Kong attacking the subway was added last minute to the film, so the movie would come out to being 14 reels instead of 13 reels. 13's unlucky after all, a lot like these poor schmucks on the train. In the end, Kong takes Anne and climbs atop the then brand new Empire State Building and is confronted by biplanes, piloted in cameo appearances by the film's directors, Cooper and Shudsack, who claim that since they made King Kong, they should kill the son of a bitch themselves. Even though Kong is such a savage beast, it's still tragic watching him die to the biplane gunfire. Willis O'Brien's animation of Kong's death is heartbreaking. Kong was taken from his home to the one jungle he could never survive in, man's. Kong never stood a chance. Kong's death, letting himself be cornered atop the Empire State Building defending Anne, is foreshadowed from the very beginning and echoed after his demise. A beast was a tough guy too, but when he saw beauty, she got him. He forgot his wisdom and the little fellas licked him. Kong's the mightiest thing alive, but when he fell in love, he finally had a weakness. He stopped worrying about his own survival and it became his downfall. Literally! Ah, bashed his head on the way down. Poor bastard. The airplanes got him. It wasn't the airplanes. It was beauty killed the beast. The original King Kong is easily one of the greatest films of all time. The end-all be-all of escapist adventure films. It pushed the boundaries in every conceivable way, and besides a rush sequel, there weren't really any other movies like King Kong during its time that extensively used effects, stop motion, or otherwise. Films of King Kong's kind were a rarity until the next generation of filmmakers came along influenced by Kong, like Willis O'Brien's protege, Ray Harryhausen, using effects to help tell stories that were out of the ordinary, showing things that are impossible in the real world, but without King Kong, the impossible wouldn't be possible. And that's why he's still the eighth wonder to this day. I give the original King Kong a beauty out of the beast. It wasn't the airplanes. It was beauty killed the beast. Actually, now that I think about it, those airplanes did shoot Kong with bullets. And that's probably what killed him. If you enjoyed this video, I'll be covering more giant monsters like Kong's son and his Japanese rival Godzilla. So make sure to subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss out on those future videos. This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VI IP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out.